So, uh, so far we have talked about a uh, lot of things, a lot of preliminary stuff that is needed in order to understand the actual cybersecurity component of this class. So we have talked about optimization and we have talked about uh, stochastic process, not stochastic process, but statistics and probability. And what we are going to do today, in the previous class I said that there are still a few hypothesis testing problems that I wanted to cover in the class, but I'm not going to do that. I'll cover it when the actual time comes. Um, and so now, in, from today onwards, we just want to talk about cybersecurity. We want to talk about cyber attacks. We want to talk about detection. And we want to talk about uh, response uh, against cyber attacks. So that's the goal for the rest of the semester until Thanksgiving. And then after Thanksgiving, it's the project time. So what I want to do today is to set the landscape in today's class and in the, uh, on Friday's class. What I want to talk about is just the uh, you know, putting everything into the perspective. Now that we know a lot of background stuff, we can put everything in perspective. And I want to talk about different types of uh, cyber attacks that have been launched on real systems and uh, what all things have happened in this field. Okay, so that's something I want to talk about in today's class and in Friday's class. And then next week on Monday, I'm going to talk about um, um, uh, different, three different control systems and attack models and so on. Um, and and uh, those are the assignment problems. So what I want to talk about is what the problem is in the classroom and then of course you will get to do the assignment as, as the time progresses during the semester. So on Wednesday there is no class next week because I'm traveling. Uh, so uh, so there will be no class but on Monday there will be a class next week. Okay, so, so let me talk a little bit about cyber physical systems. So uh, cyber physical system was a term coined somewhere around 2005. And the idea was that at that time in 2005, a lot of control systems were getting online. So it had, I mean, some of it was already there, but it was just a trend that was, that was starting, not starting, but it was sort of uh, going up very rapidly. So what is, a, what is the traditional control model? So if you bought a washing machine back in uh, 1950, uh, there'll be a washing machine, there'll be a plug point, there'll be some water hose, and uh, all the controller would be within the washing machine, and this controller would be sort of analog controller. It will figure out how much to rotate the uh, 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 rotate the drum, uh, which basically cleans the clothes. And that's it. There will be some analog controller there. There will be a few switches on the, on the control panel. And that's it. That's the washing machine of 1950s. And then if you go ahead and buy a washing machine now, it has a lot of electronic components in it. Okay? And the controller actually is a microprocessor. It's a chip. Or it could be an FPGA. And that adds a computing element to the control system, okay? And the computing element there is actually looking at the data, it's converting it into bits, and then those bits are then getting converted into analog signal at the motor level or at some other sensor level, which is water temperature sensor and so on. It's getting converted into that, and then it gets executed uh, on the, uh, and uh, executed on the machine. So there is a computing element that got added as time progressed, as more microcontrollers and chips started infiltrating our day-to-day -day systems. If you look at the thermostat, it's no longer an analog. So in my office, there is an analog thermostat, which I don't know how it works, but it's like a 40, 50-year-old thermostat, I think. Uh, so it's an analog thermostat. And there is a slider, and I have to slide it up and down in order to change the temperature of my room. If you look at this thermostat, this is a digital thermostat. There is a temperature sensor, but all that information gets converted into bits and, and, and gets stored or gets communicated in bits. So that's the computing element. Now, all those sensors are connected to a microcontroller which changes those analog signals to digital signals and stores it in the memory or communicates it with the outside world. And that adds the communication element. So if you look at this thermostat, 
what is it doing? It's not only measuring the temperature, and there is an up and down button so that we can increase the temperature or reduce the temperature of the room. But it's also communicating the temperature to some central authority within this building. And what is that authority doing? It's looking at the temperature and it's figuring out uh, whether the air conditioning module of this particular room has gone bad or not, okay? So there is a communication component now added to this particular thermostat and now we are seeing a situation where there is a controller which sits on a computer which communicates with the outside world and that outside world then affects the control signal that's going into the system. Okay, and that's the architecture. That's called a cyber physical system because now you have a cyber, you have a physical system and you have a cyber component. And the cyber component includes the computing element and the communication element within the system. And this is hap happening in every sector. So no matter which sector you go to, uh, for instance, automotive vehicle, a 1950 vehicle will be a completely mechanical device, okay? Uh, but a vehicle today is not a mechanical device. It's an electronic device which happens to have mechanical components, okay? And there are millions of lines of code written for instance for the aircraft. So the Wright brothers who were living not too far from here, they were actually in Dayton, Ohio, which is maybe like an hour long drive from here. So Wright brothers created a completely analog aircraft and they showed that it can fly. It can have a controlled flight. Uh, but today's aircrafts have millions of lines of code written on it, which looks at a lot of different things. And it also communicates with the ground station and so today's aircraft is also has all the three elements of control, computation, and communication. And no matter which sector you look at, this is infiltrating, this idea of adding a communication device and adding a computing device to a control system, it's getting prolifer it's proliferating in almost every uh, industry. So every industry is becoming a cyber physical system. Now if you abstract all these uh, stuff, you will see, not at a very high level, but if you go component by component in every of these industries, this is what the system looks like, okay? So there is a plant. The plant is uh, like a vehicle, or the plant could be a chemical reactor, or a plant could be just a, a air conditioning system and so on. So there is a plant, there is an actuator, so actuator would be the engine in the case of a vehicle. Uh, it would be the compressor in the case of an air conditioning system. And it could be a, a heating device or a, or a, a air handling unit in the case of a building management system. Okay, and then there are sensors. Of course, we talked a lot about this thermostat and the temperature sensor, but you could have pressure sensor, you could have um, uh, acoustic sensors, and so on. Uh, pressure, acoustic, camera, LIDAR. So these are different types of sensors that people are using. Now, the actuator and the plant and the sensors, of course, there could be some communication between plant and the sensor, but pretty much actuator, plant, and sensor, they are all in series. And then there is a communication channel. And in the communication channel, sensor pushes the information to the communication channel. There is some estimation module. So in case there is a lot of error in the sensor reading, there is an estimation module that looks at what the true state is or estimates the true state based on the conditional expectation, uh, which is something we have studied. And then it could also have a detection module. And that detection module is basically isolating faults or detecting if there is an attack going on. Uh, of course, this. Uh, stuff for the fault situation, so detecting a fault if a sensor has gone bad or an actuator has gone bad, that detection module is there in most of the safety critical systems because you know you can't have uh, an aircraft which cannot figure out what's going what's going on inside the aircraft. So detection module is pretty much there in most of the fault tolerant systems, but maybe in say your washing machine there may not be a detection module or your dishwasher, there may not be a detection module. So if something goes wrong, somebody has to come and fiddle around and change things and try to understand what's going wrong with that system. 
Of course, if you buy more advanced, like, I don't know, $10,000 dishwasher, it probably will have some detection module. But uh, if you buy like a $400 dishwasher, they don't really have a sophisticated detection module. It may have very simple ones, but not uh, a good detection module. Now this information gets fed to the planning and potentially learning. So learning is again something we haven't talked about in this class. But of course, uh, I'm sure you all know that learning is happening everywhere using all the data that is getting collected. So let's forget about this learning block. Let's look at the planning block. And then uh, this planning is where all the optimization stuff that we talked about goes, goes in. So you could have a PID controller here. You could have a more sophisticated optimization here. And this planning module might be getting some information from outside. So for instance, uh, in the case of building management system, it's going to look at the temperature, the weather, outside weather, what's the temperature outside, what's the humidity, is it raining, it's not raining, and all that stuff. So it's going to get some information from the outside. And in the case of a vehicle, the planning module will get information from the traffic lights or from other sources of information. There is a traffic downstream, there is a road blockage, there is some accident. All of that stuff will come into the planning module. And based on all these sources of information, the planning module will run some optimization algorithm to figure out, okay, what is it that I'm supposed to do next? And then the planning module's output will go through the communication channel to the actuator, and then the actuator will, will execute some command, and then the plant will, of course, uh, uh, change the state accordingly, and then the sensor will sense it, and then this whole loop will get uh, uh, closed. Now within this communication channel, even though I've written it as a communication channel, it could be a wired communication channel, as is the case with this building management system. So there is a wire that's running all throughout the building and connecting to a central device, which is collecting all the data and making a decision. That's the planning module part. Um, but the communication channel may have wire. It could be wired. Uh, it could be wired. It could be wireless. Um, we all know what wireless is. Um, it could also be radio waves, or it could be some other form of communication medium. If you're doing underwater communication, um, you could have sonar waves, which is like acoustic waves that is used for communication. So you could have very different types of communication channel depending on what the actual application is. But besides communication, there will also be microcontrollers, which is going to take in bits and it will convert it into a signal that the actuator understands. So in the case of compressor, the actu if the actuator is a compressor, the compressor takes in a 240 volt multiplied by a certain number of amperes for running the compressor, right? So, um, so in that case, the microcontroller will say, okay, the compressor has to run at this particular uh, ampere level and this particular voltage level and then there will be a device which will convert that signal into 480 volts or 240 volts, whatever is the rating, and whatever ampere is supposed to go into the compressor. So, so there is some amount of wires or wireless medium, some amount of computing device, which is mostly a digital to analog or analog to digital converter, and then it goes into the actuator, and same thing here. Uh, this particular area may have uh, wires, it could be wireless, it could be acoustic, uh, like uh, water, if it is acoustic waves. And then there will be some computing machinery which will convert the signal coming from sensor into something that can then be communicated and transmitted to the estimation and detection module. So in the case of vehicles or ships or aircrafts, this communication module is completely um, done over wires. It could be either a twisted pair or it could be coaxial cable or it could be some other form of wires. Um, when you are doing a, uh, so ground communications typically happens in uh, radio waves or it could be in some other waves. It could have some frequency range for ground communication. And then you could, uh, in the case of underwater, of course, I talked about the acoustic waves. Um, and what else? Yeah, so mostly wire, wireless, acoustic, those are the technologies that are used in communication module here. 
Any question on this figure? Okay, so why is uh, security important? So when you have so many different pieces in a complicated system, each of them provide some attack surface to an adversary. So, it, so if in uh, 1950s, if I wanted to attack your washing machine, I'll have to physically come inside your house and break your washing machine, okay? That's the attack model in 1950s. Now today, because a lot of these things are connected, I could either attack the control controller. Let me go back. I could attack the planning module here. I could attack the estimation module here. I could attack the communication channel on this side. I could attack the communication channel on this side. And I mentioned that there are computing devices here and here, and I could attack those computing devices as well. I could put a virus on that computing device, and I could jeopardize the entire system. So there are so many different attack surfaces. In addition to the usual attack where somebody can physically come into the room and, and break the stuff. Okay, So that is always there, but now you don't really have to be physically present in that location to attack. You can pretty much attack it from anywhere in the world. Um, so you could attack the computing device, you could attack the communication device. Of course, there are millions of dollars being spent on both safeguarding control systems or cyber physical systems from intruders, or if an intruder has gotten into it, then they pay money to the intruders in order to stop the attack and gain back the control of the system. Um, you could, of course, have destruction of the property, which was the case in Stuxnet worm. You could have environmental disaster. So this is a famous incident back in 1997 or 8, perhaps one of the first attacks on a control on a cyber physical system. And here, what happened was an employee who was fired from the water treatment company, he knew about all the communication and control protocol there. So he remotely attacked one of the um, one of the, uh, I don't know what it's called, like the water was supposed to go to the treatment plant, the sewage water was supposed to go to the treatment plant and then it was supposed to be released to the river and instead he channeled that water directly to the river and that caused an environmental disaster. That happened in Australia back in 1997-98. So that's called Maruchi. Uh, water plant attack or something like that. And then you could of course have physical harm, harm to people. This is a Jeep Cherokee that was attacked in 2015 by researchers. And this car is in St. Louis. Uh, the researchers were in Texas, I think in Dallas. And they remotely attacked the car. And even though there was a driver in this car, the car was, they remotely steered the car into this uh, ditch. Uh, on the side of the road. And that was, uh, of course, it didn't harm the driver, but you can imagine what all things can be done remotely. Of course, all of these attacks have now been, I mean, you cannot at attack like this now because they have fixed the problem. Uh, but, uh, but as new technologies are coming up, you could have uh, similar problems in the newer uh, systems. So there are, of course, uh, broader impact. Uh, uh, manufacturing is becoming more intelligent. Whenever something is becoming intelligent, it means that there is, in addition to control, there is computing and communication, and, and it means that there are too many attack surfaces now. So manufacturing is becoming intelligent, which means it is uh, area ripe for hackers to start hacking. Uh, power systems, uh, I have shown you the, the hack in the first class where a generator was blown up by Department of Homeland Security researchers. So power systems is vulnerable to attack. Transportation systems are vulnerable to attack. Um, I have also mentioned in the transportation system, I had mentioned in the first class about a ship whose GPS signals were hacked uh, by researchers from UT Austin. And that ship was basically steered. The ship was supposed to come from UK to US, and instead it was steered toward Brazil by hacking the GPS signal. So transportation systems are also vulnerable to attack. There's another very cool incident. It wasn't really an attack, but 
you can think of it as an attack. So you know these truck drivers in the US, they have GPS spoofing on their trucks because their employers tend to track where the truck is going. So for whatever reason, for privacy reason or for whatever reason, they, they put a GPS spoofer so then their employers cannot track where the truck is. And so there was this truck that was going close to the Washington DC, like uh, Washington DC airport, DCA, uh, Washington DC airport. And, and because there was a GPS spoofer, the aircraft's GPS signals were spoofed at that time. And at every 11 a.m., there used to be some spoofing happening at the aircraft's GPS signals and nobody knew what the problem was. And later on, people realized that there was a truck driver who was passing by every 11 a.m. and he had a GPS spoofer which was affecting the uh, GPS signals at the aircraft uh, thing. Of course, it was unintended. The truck driver didn't really want to stop all the traffic on the airport, but that's what eff effectively happened because of that incident. So transportation sector is also vulnerable to attack. Of course, this market of CPS security is growing at an exponential rate. So you have taken the right course <laughs> at OSU. Uh, you can become really rich if you go into the cybersecurity area, and particularly cybersecurity of critical infrastructure, which is the course, which is the purpose of this course, securing autonomous systems. And Keep these areas in mind. You can become really rich if you address problems in these areas. So now let's look at the individual components and what happens when there are cyber attacks on these systems. So this is our CPS, uh, cyber physical system. So I'm not looking at a system like a big chemical plant as a whole. I'm looking at individual components within a chemical plant. I'm looking at individual components in an oil refinery or in a mining uh, problem or in a, in a vehicle. So I'm not looking at the entire vehicle as a whole, but I'm looking at an individual component of the vehicle, which essentially looks like this. So in the control part, you have actuator, plant, and sensor. In the communication part, there will be networking, it could be distributed systems. What distributed system means that there are a lot of different components in the communication channel. Each of them are communicating to each other. And sometimes these communication channels could be really very large scale. So by large scale, imagine a wind farm, an offshore wind farm. R right now there is a lot of offshore wind farm getting constructed across the world. And these offshore wind farms have uh, the wind turbines have a diameter of maybe like 50 meters or 100 meters, okay? 100 meters is a very l large number. Uh, people actually run, there's a 100 meter race in Olympics. So 100 meters is a very large number and you can imagine there are wind turbines that have 100 meter diameter and you have like thousands of wind turbines all over the place. It's a very, very large scale geographically distributed control system and they have to communicate, okay? It's just a requirement, they have to communicate over that large scale system. So the communication channel there is extremely distributed. Um, OSU is a large scale system. So OSU is spread around, like it has the entire campus, right? It's uh, so many acres of land on which there are so many buildings. Each building has so many sensors and so many actuators. So it's a very large scale system. Of course, we are concentrating on, a, on, a, on the air conditioning system of this particular room, but there are maybe like 1,000 rooms like that in the entire university. So it's a large scale system. And within, of course, the computing module, there is estimation, detection, planning, and learning. The learning part in the university right now is very minimal. So if you look at the university's infrastructure, uh, right now they are putting more sensors, but the learning part will come in, kick in, maybe like five years later, where there will be a lot of learning experiments across the campus. Uh, but there is planning happening. Uh, so uh, somebody in the building, some computer in the building is figuring out how much air conditioning we need to run, how much of fresh air we need to intake, and how are we supposed to distribute that air across the room. So the planning component is already there inside the building, and there is certainly an estimation and detection component. 
the detection component is rather new. It's not really an old system here. So now in the university, if something goes bad in the air handling units, uh, people will get to know about it remotely. So the detection module is working. Um, I think the company is Copper Tree. It's a startup, Copper Tree. And they are the ones selling the detection module. So there is Copper Tree and there is uh, Delta Controls. Those are the two people selling the detection module to the university for uh, remote, est for figuring out if something has gone bad and then going ahead and repairing those problems. <coughs> okay. So initially you go through the system design phase. So there is a piece of land and there is some problem I need to solve. Uh, maybe it's extraction of uh, metals, maybe it's uh, refining of oil or something else, manufacturing uh, dishwasher. So you first have to design the system. You have to figure out, okay, what's the control system? What's the communication in in infrastructure we need? What's the computing devices we need and so on. Then this system gets installed. All these algorithms have been designed. So they, they, these algorithms are deployed. And then they start running what is known as anomaly detection algorithm for detecting uh, if there is some, some problem within the, within the system. Now, the hypothesis test, which was the topic in the previous two classes, the anomaly detection algorithms are all hypothesis tests running on the system. So we talked about like a very few hypothesis tests in the class, but if you want to proceed further in this particular field, in the field of cybersecurity, what you want to do is go to the statistics department and take an anomaly detection course because that entire course is about hypothesis testing for various hypotheses. So that's where you will learn a lot of test statistics and a lot of uh, rejection region and a lot of different hypotheses. And uh, that is studied under the umbrella of anomaly detection. Now anomaly detection could be passive or active, okay? So we are concerning ourselves with cybersecurity now. So the anomaly detection could be passive or active. In passive anomaly detection, you're not changing the actions at all. What you're doing is you're looking at the data as it comes in, and you're trying to infer if the system is under attack or if the system is not under attack, or if there is a fault or there is no fault in the system. So that's passive anomaly detection. Active anomaly detection is where you actually actively change the control signal. So the planning algorithm is saying that the volume of air that should be uh, rejected in this particular room should be, I don't know, one cubic meter per minute. I just made up that number. In the active, in the passive case, you're just looking at the temperature data and trying to figure out if the air handling unit has gone bad. In the active case, what you're doing is you say, okay, the planning module says I'm supposed to put one cubic meter per minute, but I'm going to send 1.1 cubic meter per minute in this time step, in this minute, then I will send <clears throat> 0 0.99 cubic meter per minute in the next minute, and then I will send 1.05 cubic meter in the next minute, and so on and so forth. So that is the active detection module where you are actively changing the control signal to detect if something is going, going bad in the system or not. Then there is, once you are, if you have detected some, some anomaly, then you have to do causal identification. <coughs> so the causal identification, you have to see whether this anomaly is due to a disturbance, a fault, or an attack. So consider this scenario. You are responsible for this whole building and you're looking at the temperature data from this particular room. And you see that suddenly at 12.40 p.m., the temperature has started rising of this room. Now you have to, so that's the anomaly detector. It raised an alarm that, look, the temperature is rising inside this room. It's not stable. Now you have to figure out, you have to do causal identification. Is this temperature rising because it's a full class? There are 50 people in this class. Well, there are not. There are six people in the class. So what they have to do is they have to see whether this rise in temperature is because there are 50 people in the class, so that's the disturbance part. Whether the rise in temperature is because the air handling unit has gone bad and so it's not uh, rejecting cold air inside the room. 
So that would be a fault. Or there is an attack. So I am standing next to the sensor, and I am blocking the sensor from measuring the temperature of the room. And so the sensor is measuring the temperature of my hand, and not necessarily the temperature of the room. So that's an attack. Okay. So you have to do causal identification. Why exactly is this attack happening? In this particular course, we are not going to talk about causal identification, but it's an important topic. And causal identification can also be viewed as a hypothesis test that now that I have detected this anomaly, is this anomaly due to a disturbance, or is it due to a fault, or is it due to an attack? So that would be a causal identification problem. <coughs> yes? Yeah. Doesn't this estimation come from learning? Because when you are estimating something, you so typically learning. estimation is not due to learning. You could of course learn an estimator. Those would be like uh, more complicated uh, for more complicated systems. But for general systems, estimation is typically a very simple uh, Kalman filter or particle filter or something like that. We have not talked about estimation in this class, but if you take uh, some stochastic processes class, then there is a whole chapter on estimation in those classes. But you can use learning to do estimation, but uh, it's not generally deployed in today's system. Maybe like 10 years later, that would be the case, but not at, not at the moment. So, like, even if <coughs> say, uh, we are uh, estimating some output. Yes. Some output. For a system. Yes. So that also we will be doing by <coughs> like making like learning from the system actually, right? Uh, how the output should be. And right. So and I don't know what you mean by learning from the system because the system models in most of these cases are already well known, and they are well known because they have been operating the system for a very long time, so they kind of know what the system model looks like. So they don't really have to learn it. Now, if you're talking about estimating, say what the state of the traffic light is from camera input, which is the sensor, and, and you're trying to estimate what the situation at the camera, at the traffic light is, then there, yes, learning is being used to estimate the state. But if you're trying to figure out what the velocity of your car is based on the four rotation sensors, you don't really need uh, learning for that particular problem. It's, uh, it's really a linear multiplication and some, some sort of very simple algorithm. <coughs> Yeah. Any other question? So once you have, let's say you have identified that uh, the problem is due to a fault or an attack, then you have to come up with a response strategy. And the response strategy could be ti time triggered or it could be detection triggered. What I mean by that is uh, your response could be at 12 midnight, this is what we are going to do or it could be detection triggered that now that I've detected that the air handling unit of this particular room has gone bad, uh, maybe I'm going to turn on some other air handling unit of the rooms nearby so that this room is getting some amount of cold air, if not a whole lot of cold air. So that's a detection triggered. Now, the response has to look into what sort of attack is happening? And there are multiple types of attacks that happens on autonomous systems. So you could have eavesdropping attack, where what the attacker is trying to do is just look at the sensor data. It's not doing anything. It's not harming the system. It's just listening to the data. Uh, you could have uh, reverse engineering. So as the attacker is looking at the data, it's trying to reverse engineer what exactly is that system, that component, that microcontroller doing. So that's reverse engineering. And what it does is it discloses the information, proprietary information, to the attacker. So consider this situation. An attacker is looking at your smart meter data about how much electricity is getting consumed minute by minute at your home. OK, it's eavesdropping. And then it's doing reverse engineering. So it figures out that, oh, there is a light bulb that turned on at 7 PM. So this guy is at home. OK? And then there is some cooking range that is turned on at 8 PM. So this guy is cooking the food, right? So it's reverse engineering. It's trying to figure out 
through eavesdropping, it's trying to figure out information about you, and that's the disclosure attack. <clears throat> then you could have disruption attacks. So disruption attacks are of two types, jamming and denial of service. It's very similar. So in jamming, what you do is there is a communication channel, so a wireless communication medium, and you have a transmitter and a receiver, just like I have a transmitter in my pocket and there is a receiver at the camera. And what you do is you figure out, okay, this thing is communicating at two gigahertz. So I'm going to come up with a device which is going to send a very strong white noise at two gigahertz uh, uh, frequency. And that's going to jam the signal from my transmitter to the receiver. So that's the jamming attack. Typically in the wireless domain, you could have a jamming attack. In the case of underwater communication, if you're using sound waves, then of course you can have jamming attack because you could add additional sound signals so as to disrupt the uh, communication between two parties inside the water. The denial of service attack is a slightly <clears throat> different attack, but the goal is the same. It's to prevent information from going from one point to another. So here is how denial of service attacks are launched. So, so you have uh, servers that are taking information, new information, and then outputting based on some computation. It's outputting some other information. And these servers are at different, different locations across the country. Now, what a, ja what a denial of service attacker would do is it will start asking the server for new information. Now, the server has to provide that information to this particular person who's asking for it. But what this person will do is, is he or she will keep asking for that information every millisecond or every microsecond. So now the server becomes busy sending information to this guy because this guy is just asking for more and more and more information. And so the server becomes unavailable for all the other people to use. And that's a denial of service attack. And uh, this attack is extremely common for the following reason. Um, so a lot of this planning and estimation and communication, a lot of it is happening at the server level, somewhere inside the building or somewhere uh, in a cloud location. Now, there are a lot of wireless uh, transponders, for instance, traffic lights, who are supposed to receive information from those sensors. So what the hackers, and now these are lightweight device, okay? So whatever is the device at the traffic light, it's not going to be very sophisticated computer. It's going to be a lightweight computer with some communication uh, capability. So what the hackers do is they attack all of these very lightweight communication devices at traffic lights or at some other infrastructure location. And they use that to start launching the denial of service attack because now you have like uh, access to 100,000 such uh, wireless sensors or transponders. And then you can start requesting information from the server over uh, uh, and overwhelm the server with a lot of requests so it's not able to uh, use the, it's not able to serve the real customers. So this is the disruption attack because you're disrupting the information to go from one point to another, okay? Now denial of service attack could happen on this side of the communication channel or on this side of the communication channel. And the one that is most serious is disruption at the sensor level. So if you can disrupt the information from the sensor to go to the estimation or planning module, it can really cause a lot of damage. If you are just, uh, uh, disrupting the actuator signal going from planning to the actuator, uh, at most the plant will shut down automatically. Okay, so things may not get harmed, but it might shut down. So that's the disruption attack. Now comes the most important and problematic attack of all types. So these are known as spoofing attacks. So in spoofing attack, the attacker actively changes the information that's going to the intended recipient. So you could have three types of spoofing attack. One is a replay attack, which if you have watched Ocean's Eleven or if you have watched these uh, people who go and rob banks movies, uh, they always have replay attack. And what replay attack does is it eavesdrop for some time, looks at the data, stores it in the memory, 
and then streams the same data at the next time step and streams the same data at the subsequent time step. So that's a replay attack because it's replaying the same data again and again. And so in Ocean's Eleven or, or bank robbery kind of uh, things, they look at the camera feed, some hacker comes in, for some reason they are able to find a hacker, okay? And they ask the hacker to store the camera feed and replay it again and again and then they go and you know, take out money or whatever. So that's the replay attack, and we have seen a lot of these attacks in movies. There is a zero dynamics attack, and what zero dynamics attack does is it, it simulates the sensor. So in this case, the attacker needs to know what the dynamics of the system is, and it, it uh, so instead of, so what it does is it looks at the control system model, it sets the controller to be equal to zero, the control action to be equal to zero, and it looks at the sequence of states that are coming out, and then it sends that sequence of state to the, to the uh, estimation or the planning module. So the estimation and planning module is thinking that it seems to me that the actuator has failed, so I should do something, uh, or, or the actuator is saturating, or something wrong is going on with the actuator, so let me try to increase my effort so that I can stabilize the system and get it to wherever I wanted to get it to. And then that creates a, a, a big, big challenge because uh, you could oversaturate the, sense, uh, the actuator or you could blow up the plant uh, if things, uh, things are not right, if you don't have enough checks and balances to shut down the plant. So that's zero dynamics attack. The problem with zero dynamics attack is people would think, the detector would think that it's coming from an authentic source because the data distribution is that of zero dynamics. So it's coming from a physical system rather than, a <clears throat> uh, rather than somebody sending random information to us. So it's, uh, it could create a lot of problem. And then false data injection is, is uh, basically injecting false data. Now false data could be some IID random noise, so I'm looking at the phase angle of, not phase, but the voltage that's coming into my building, and it, I'm going to spoof that system, and I'm going to send some random noise, like uh, sometimes it's 10 volt, at the next time instant it uh, 20 volts, and at some point of time it's 220 volts, and so on. So that's false data injection. If, you are, <coughs> if the adversary is sending false data, Many a times it's easy to detect that it's a false data, but if the adversary is more intelligent, it can send zero dynamics data, and it would be very difficult for you to distinguish whether it's a, it's a legitimate uh, dynamics or, or is, it's coming from an attacker. So all these different types of attacks are spoofing attacks. What's the difference between replay and zero dynamics? <clears throat> so replay is, I'm looking at the current, uh, sequence of states, and I'm going to send that sequence of states at the next time step. And zero, dynamics. zero dynamics is I have a model for the system, I'm going to figure out what happens if the control action is zero. I'm going to look at the sequence of states, and then I'm going to send that sequence of states to the planning module. Okay. So two things that you should note is, of course, every system has some sort of disturbance and it could have some sort of fault. Most people know about this. And what you need to do is introduce robustness into your system. Uh, so if one of the sensors has failed, so for instance, in aircrafts, in an engine, they will have odd number of sensors so that if one or two sensors fail, uh, they can still measure what the temperature inside the engine is. Okay, so that's adding robustness to the system. Now, robustness always comes at a price. Okay, so if you could use one temperature sensor inside the engine, that will of course be low cost, but but then it would become highly uh, non-robust. So you want to introduce robustness, so you have to add more sensors, so you have to increase the cost of the component of the system. Or robustness could also mean that you have a uh, optimization algorithm or a control algorithm which is which is very very conservative like how we drive the vehicle okay we are not driving very aggressively we are driving very conservatively that also introduces robustness 
and it comes at some cost. So in the case of driving, if you're driving conservatively, you're driving at lower speeds, you will reach your destination at a later time, okay? On the other hand, if you were an aggressive driver, you will reach your destination very quickly. So if you introduce robustness in your driving strategy, it automatically means that uh, you are adding cost in some sense. So either that cost could be in terms of performance or that cost could be in terms of added uh, cost of components uh, when you're designing the system. Introducing robustness also allows you to uh, measure faults. So if you have a dishwasher and uh, you put one temperature sensor, if that sensor fails, then the entire dishwasher will not work. So if you put two temperature sensors or three temperature sensors, even if one temperature sensor fails, you can still run the dishwasher, but then you need to call the technician to fix the second sensor. So it allows you to measure faults and then perhaps have some um, way to let the system work, allow the system to work even in the presence of that fault. On the other hand, when you have an attack and you want the system to still function properly, that particular type of uh, system design is known as resilient system design. And resiliency means that even if a fault has occurred or even if an um, attack is occurring, uh, the system is able to run as intended. Or even if it is not able to run, it basically has a performance that degrades very graciously and in a controlled way. So let me give you an example of resiliency. So you're driving an autonomous car and the car is under attack. So one of the wheel sensors has been attacked. Uh, you can still do the fault, uh, the fault uh, uh, estimation algorithm will be able to still figure out what the velocity of the vehicle is based on the other three wheel sensors. On the other hand, if there is a more complicated attack on the camera or LIDAR or radar or some of the underlying computing machinery, then the autonomous car has to detect the attack and then it has to say, look, at this point of time driving on a highway is very dangerous or driving in general is dangerous. I cannot give the control to the human driver because the human driver is asleep in the car. So what I should do is I should just stand on the side of the road until somebody, some, some tow truck comes and tows the car to the garage. So that's resiliency. It's able to detect the attack and it's able to come to a halt on the side of the road, not in the middle of the road, but on the side of the road. That's resiliency. That means that your car is resilient, your autonomous car is resilient to cyber attack. Or if you have a large scale oil refinery and some component is attacked, the refinery is still functioning as intended, or if there is a performance degradation, it happens in a very controlled fashion. It's not like things just starts blowing up all over the place. So if things blow up, it's not resilient. If things don't blow up, and it, it is degrading, things are degrading at a controlled and intended fashion, then it is resilient. So each of these ideas, there is a course in the university on each of these topics. So uh, in this course, of course, I'm giving you an overview with the hope that in your degree program, depending on your interests and the industry that you're targeting, you can take individual courses that can help you get a better handle on each of these different uh, uh, theory for designing controllers and for doing uh, optimization. Of course, in this class, we are focusing more on anomaly detection and the response for some specific cases. Um, and we'll talk about both passive anomaly detection and active anomaly detection. And we'll talk about time-triggered uh, response and detection-triggered response in the, in the rest of the course. Okay, any questions so far? That was a lot of data dump in 30, 40 minutes. The, the, uh, the attack domain you mentioned. Yes. Are these like the only things that could happen or maybe more strategies might be also available for as an attack? Right. So, so these are very broad classes. 
yeah. and they would cover let's say like 80 or 90 percent of the attacks uh -huh. the rest of the 10 percent may be very specialized attacks and may not be covered but in my uh, experience I have never seen an attack that falls outside of these these but I'm I'm talking about more reading papers mm -hmm. But there are cybersecurity people who have been in industry for 40, 30, 35, 40 years, and they probably have seen some of those specialized attacks. I just haven't. OK. So that concludes this class. In the next class, I am going to talk a little bit about security goals. So as cybersecurity engineers, what are you supposed to do? And I'm going to be using this particular book, Cybersecurity Analytics. Uh, by CRC, like it's published through CRC Press, and the authors are Rakesh Verma and David Marshett. I have actually enjoyed reading this book, so if you intend to become a cybersecurity engineer, I would highly suggest you buy this book. Uh, so I'm going to be teaching a few topics from this particular book in the next class, just some introductory chapters. Uh, this book is mainly about machine learning, how to use machine learning for attack detection, and it is mostly focused on things like email spam, detecting spam emails, or, or you know, it's not about securing autonomous systems. It's more about emails and databases and all those encryption and decryption kind of things, not necessarily uh, cyber physical systems. But, uh, but it, it's a good book. I, I really like, enjoyed reading this book. So next class, I'm going to talk about some introductory chapters from this book. And then I'll talk about some specific control systems that has these three components uh, on Monday. All right. Thank you for your attention. I'll see you on Friday. <laughs>